Today we are going to cover the first German tank of the Panzer Divisions, a light tank that, while not impressive on paper, played a big role in the German victories of 1939 and 1940. Hello and welcome to the Tanks of World War II video series. My name is Tom with Tank and AFV News. Um, this is the second episode of Tanks of World War II and our plan with this series. Um, each episode we look um, at a specific tank that was used during World War II, starting with the beginning of the war in 1939 and moving eventually all the way to the end of the war in 1945. Um, now this episode is uh, part of a sub-series. We're going to divide this show up into sub-series based on campaigns. And this first one, of course, is the Polish Campaign of 1939. We'll be looking at four vehicles. And this second episode deals with the German Panzer I, or Panzerkampfwagen I, if you want to get technical. I'm just going to call it the Panzer I because it's, well, it's easier to say than Panzerkampfwagen all episode. Um, now, this is the first of many German tanks that we'll be covering in this series. And one thing worth noting is that, you know, with some of the tanks in the series, there's not a lot of information out there on them. Um, that's not the case with these German vehicles. Um, there's been just tons of books written about them, more so about the late war tanks and the early war, but there's still plenty of materials on early war stuff. Um, partly because, you know, for, for whatever reason, German tanks have really elicited a lot of interest from military history buffs. Um, and it's fair to say gallons of ink have been spilled uh, on the paper regarding this particular topic. So with that said, I just want to clarify that this episode is not a exhaustive review of the Panzer I by any means. Um, uh, this is meant to be more of just sort of an overview um, in hitting some of the important points about the vehicle. Um, therefore, at the end of the episode, we'll provide a list of recommended books on the topic for those that want to go on and read some more. Now, while the uh, Panzer I was not the first tank to be produced by Germany, it's the first one to be produced in large numbers. Um, German production during the First World War um, had been limited to just 20 of the A7V tank, um, and then a few other prototypes that never made it into production before the war ended. Following the war, uh, Germany, of course, was restricted uh, from building more tanks. That's one of the con uh, conditions of the Versailles Treaty. Now, however, these rules were circumvented through a variety of means so that German uh, industry and military officer, officers could get some experience with tanks and armored vehicles. Often this was done sort of um, in collaboration with other countries, either, you know, sort of the Germans helping design stuff in a different country or having sort of secret training centers, the famous one being Kazan in the USSR. Um, and in the mid-1920s, a secret program was initiated by the German military to produce tanks under the guise of being uh, tractors. So they're also sort of developing stuff in secret and labeling them as something other than a tank, obviously. Um, now, the prime result of that program was the gross tractor, um, which just means large tractor, and the light tractor, which is the light tractor, um, so sort of a, a heavy and a light tank. Um, and these are the primary results of that program. Now, it should be mentioned at this point, um, two of the key figures in the mechanization of the German Army in the 1930s um, were Oswald Lutz, who was the Inspector General of Motor Transport Troops, um, and his Chief of Staff, a, a fellow named Heinz Guderian. Uh, now, Guderian is a name that you're going to hear multiple times throughout the series. Um, he's a very important figure in the development of the German Panzer uh, divisions and uh, would go on during the war. Uh, to develop doctrine, uh, sort of uh, vehicles, as well as lead troops in the field. Um, and now his, his, his reputation also is based on the fact that he also wrote a couple books that became quite popular after the war, uh, Achtung Panzer and Panzer Leader. Um, so aside from being, you know, he was a genuinely talented uh, officer and commander, he also had a real knack for self-promotion too, which, which comes out. Now, despite enthusiasm from Hitler for the development of the Panzer uh, Force, uh, production of these vehicles was sort of relatively slow um, and uneven. Um, and the Panzer III and IV in particular were available only in very limited numbers by the time war broke out um, at the end of the decade in 1939. Now, this meant that the Panzer I, a vehicle intended as a stopgag measure uh, to be used as a tool to train and gain experience with, ended up being used as a frontline tank in the period of 1939 through 1941. Now, of all of the German World War II tanks, the Panzer I is the only one that has a strong foreign influence to the design. 
Um, and this has to do with the fact that it's the earliest one, and therefore the Germans had to start looking around sort of for something to base their design on. And like a lot of other countries at the time, um, they looked across the English Channel to England and the firm of Vickers and the, the designs of Cardin and Lloyd, who had done um, a series of vehicles, um, including the, uh, their Mark VI Tankette, which, as we saw in our last episode, was the basis for the Polish Tankettes. Um, they also did a, um, other vehicles, a series of light tanks, artillery tractors, and um, what would go on to become known as the, the Bren Gun Carrier, Universal Carrier. Um, so when you look at the suspension of the Panzer I, you'll notice it does have a distinctly British look to it. Um, now, one of the things, and it's sort of a, a small nitpicky point, but I want to make, a lot of the secondary sources will say that the Panzer I was based off the Cardin Lloyd Tankette series. Um, and I, that technically, that's not quite accurate. I mean, if we look here at the Mark VI Tankette, uh, we can see the suspension does not look anything like a Panzer I suspension. Um, and that's because the Panzer I is based off of uh, a Cardin Lloyd artillery tractor design. Um, and in fact, the Germans actually got one of these artillery tractors in 1931. They examined it um, and sort of uh, copied some of it. Um, and as you can see in the picture, this suspension looks an awful lot more like what's on the Panzer I that was, than what was on the Tankettes at the time. Now, you could make the argument that the Cardin Lloyd uh, artillery tractors and their light tanks, you know, were sort of, there's, there's a design uh, connection going back to the Tankettes that it's sort of an incremental improvements and whatnot. Um, but if we want to be uh, totally accurate, it's, it's this artillery tractor that's the basis of the Panzer I, not the Tankettes. Um, Sort of a nitpicky thing, but I, I like to point that out because it never made sense to me when I read it in the books. I was looking at these pictures going, these don't match. Um, now that said, uh, the Panzer I, while it's not necessarily based on the Cardin Lloyd Tankettes, it's not really that much better of a vehicle in terms of actual combat capability. Um, uh, it's roughly six tons. Um, now it does have a turret, so I guess that sort of make, fits it into the light tank category and the Germans considered it a light tank. So. We'll call it a light tank, even though it's really not a whole lot better than the tank at the time. Um, uh, as far as the layout, it has a crew of two, a um, uh, driver and then a commander gunner, and they're sort of sitting, uh, you know, if you look at this thing, it's kind of got the superstructure that's sort of wider than it is deep. Um, and they're sort of sitting, uh, you know, usually whereas the driver will be in the front of the vehicle and the crew and the turret behind him, they're sort of next to each other because the turret's offset to the right. Um, so the, the driver, um, he may or may not have a radio next to him that he's supposed to operate. It depends uh, sort of the only, only, uh, only later on did all the Panzer ones have radios. Um, and then the commander who is in the turret is responsible, of course, for firing the guns. In this case, they are just machine guns. There's no cannon in this vehicle, um, just two 7.2 millimeter machine guns. Uh, now this turret's a fairly simple affair. Um, it's a manual traverse only, although obviously it's pretty small and light, so that's not that much of an issue. Uh, but there's no commander's cupola. Um, again, the turret on this thing's barely much bigger than the cupolas that's on the later war German tanks, so it'd be kind of a little funny, but you know, meaning though that the vision devices on the Panzer I are not particularly good compared to the later German tanks. Now, one thing that's particular to the German uh, Panzer I is that it's the only um, of the German-designed tanks that is not armed with the ubiquitous MG-34 machine gun. Uh, the MG-34 wasn't adopted into service when the Panzer I was developed, so the Panzer I has the older MG-13, um, two of them in the turret. And um, this, unlike the MG-34, is a magazine-fed weapon. It takes a 25-round magazine. Um, there were eight of these magazines stored in the turret with an additional 53 magazines stored in the hull in various locations. Uh, the guns are mounted in tandem, um, but they can be fired individually. And if you look at pictures, sort of a uh, overhead view, you see that one machine gun's set slightly back further than the other. Um, so it's, it gives it kind of a funny, everything about this tank's kind of asymmetrical. Um, now, typical of German tanks of this period, it had a gasoline engine mounted in the rear with a front-mounted transmission, which meant that there was a uh, drive shaft going through the length of the vehicle on the floor, um, which is pretty much the layout of all German tanks during the war, with a couple exceptions. 
Now, the early Panzer I had a Krupp M305 air-cooled four-cylinder horizontally opposed uh, piston design, which produced 57 horsepower. Um, top speed was 23 miles per hour. Uh, range was about 90 miles on road or 60 miles off road. Uh, this version would become known as the Panzer I Ausfrung A, um, or I'll just call it the Panzer I A, so I don't have to say Ausfrung all the time because it's sort of a funny word. Um, and this uh, version was found to sort of lack power and lack off road uh, capability. So they decided to come out with a better version with a bigger engine, which would become the Panzer I Ausfrung B, which I'll just call the B. Now this model had a more powerful Maybach water-cooled inline six engine, which produced almost 100 horsepower, um, and with tr uh, improvements to the transmission, um, led to obviously a better power to weight ratio, a slightly higher top speed, but more importantly, the off-road uh, capability of the vehicle was Im improved quite a bit. Now the downside of the Maybach engine, um, Obviously, an inline six is going to be a bigger engine, take up more space than a horizontally opposed to four. Uh, so they needed to make a larger engine compartment on the vehicle. So they had to stretch the back of the hull out a bit, which meant uh, adding a, uh, uh, one more road wheel. Um, and then they took the rear, um, the, the idler wheel, and raised it up off the ground. Um, on, on the A's that one sort of lay on the ground, similar like the U.S. Stewart tanks you'll see. Lifting off the ground helped the steering characteristics a bit. Um, now, the Model B was more common than the A. Um, there were about 300 of the Panzer I A's being uh, built and about 1,500 of the, the B variant. Armor protection was the same for both models. Uh, it's a modest 13 millimeter at, its, at the thickest, so along the front of the vehicle, uh, six millimeters at the thinnest you know, along the rear. Um, you know, not really enough to provide protection against anything more than just small arms fire, um, shell fragments, uh, you know, although even like sustained machine gun fire could, could damage or put one of these machines out of action uh, if, if it was concentrated enough. Um, one good thing to say about the armor is it was welded. Um, um, all German tanks other than sort of the foreign built ones uh, were welded. Uh, now in, in the late, late 30s, it was more common for tanks to be riveted. Uh, welding was a superior method for building a tank, um, definitely better than, than riveting. Um, you'll even find examples of tanks from the 30s that were bolted together, which is a terrible way of assembling a tank. Now the combat history of the Panzer I actually starts in Spain in 1936 um, during the Civil War there. Now, this, uh, Hitler had sent a detachment of Panzer I tanks to assist the fascist forces fighting for General Franco. Um, now, due to the nature of the fighting in Spain, uh, a few lessons regarding operational or tactical deployment of tanks um, was learned during the war. However, some important technical lessons became apparent. First and foremost um, was that light tanks, such as the Panzer I, were very vulnerable to uh, purpose-built anti-tank guns um, that were coming into service at that time. Um, the Panzer I matched up very poorly against the Soviet-built T-26 light tank that was, uh, had been sent to, the, uh, to Spain by the uh, USSR uh, to assist the Spanish Republicans. Now, there were even some conversions of Panzer I tanks to mount a 20 millimeter gun in the turret to combat these Soviet-built light tanks. Um, but overall, um, you know, as far as the proper way to use tanks. There, there wasn't much that could be learned in Spain. Primarily the main thing is just they're learning that these little light tanks don't really cut it up against um, 37 millimeter guns and the like. Now the next test for the Panzer I came in 1938 during the, the Anschluss, the German occupation of Austria. Now this obviously was not a combat campaign, it's a bloodless invasion, um, but it did provide the German Panzer forces with an opportunity to conduct a large scale operation. Um, and of course the Panzer I was the primary tank in the Panzer Force at this point. Um, so this is sort of the opposite of Spain. There's no lessons to be learned about the effectiveness of the vehicles because there's no fighting. But it does, unlike Spain, give an opportunity to move division sized units around to get some practice in, in, in uh, the logistics and operational aspect of, of actual Panzer operations uh, in the real world. Um, and one of the most eye-opening things for the German commanders during this was just uh, the breakdown rate, rate of some of these vehicles. Um, and so a lot of useful lessons were learned in this exercise um, in terms of teaching the fledgling German Panzer Force some you know, operational and logistical uh, lessons. <laughs>
that only can come from real world practice. Now in Poland in 1939, of course, the Panzer I made up a considerable percentage of German tanks in service. Um, it also sustained considerable casualties. Now one source states that of the 217 German tanks destroyed by Polish anti-tank guns, uh, 150 were Panzer I's. Uh, you know, any sort of stats on losses like that, just as a caveat, I'll say always take with a certain grain of salt. Um, I'm sort of having to rely on secondary sources. I'm not out there doing original resource. I don't live near an archive and I don't speak German or Polish or, you know, whatever. So I'm relying on secondary sources. Um, and uh, tank destruction loss records are always um, really tricky. They're, you, you can interpret them different ways. So anytime I give a figure like that, um, you know, it's coming from a, a, a reputable book. I hope it's accurate. There might be other information out there that's more accurate. So, you know, let me know. But it's, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm relying on, on reliable secondary sources. Um, that said, uh, the technical deficiencies of the Panzer I were generally not a significant factor in the Polish campaign. Uh, obviously, it didn't really significantly diminish the effectiveness of the German Panzer forces. Um, oddly enough, uh, as they looked back on the campaign, the German high command, there, there were issues they were not satisfied with. So while the rest of the world saw this sort of startling uh, blitzkrieg, such as it was described at the time, um, uh, the German army actually saw a lot of room for improvement. Um, and sort of, you know, the, the technical feature of the Panzer I, though, usually wasn't something that was really singled out in particular. And then looking a little ahead, so uh, in the Polish campaign of 1940, we start to see the Panzer I uh, become, it's a smaller percentage of the overall German Panzer force as they build more of the more modern Panzer III's and IVs. Um, so in, in that campaign, they've got uh, 523 Panzer I tanks out of an invasion force of 2,439 tanks. So it's really about one in five, which is a much lower ratio than in Poland. Um, but as in Poland, they proved uh, vulnerable to enemy anti-tank weapons. Um, but again, we're still a successful part of the combined armed teams that was the German Panzer Division. Um, and if the Panzer I would continue in service in dwindling numbers uh, throughout 1941 in North Africa, the Balkans campaign, um, and Operation Barbarossa in the east, of course. By 1942, it's really becoming um, hard to find in frontline use. Um, by that point, the, the ones that are left are being assigned more and more frequently to training or internal security duty. Um, because you know, once you're in 1942 in Russia and you've got T-34s and, and KVs and things like that floating about, uh, you know, the Panzer I's a pretty, uh, uh, pretty dicey proposition to, to be in. So, uh, and of course, better tanks were coming into service. Now, as with most German tanks, as we'll see throughout the series, there were a number of variants built uh, on the Panzer I uh, chassis and. Uh, we're going to take a look at some of these right now. Uh, the first and probably the most important was the uh, Panzer Befehlswagen, hopefully saying that right, um, which means small armored command vehicle. This was a purpose-built armored command uh, vehicle built on the hull of a Panzer I. It could be either the A or B variant, both were used. Um, and what they did is uh, there was no turret on the vehicle. Instead, they kind of took the hull superstructure and extended it upward into a larger compartment um, that could fit uh, a crew of three, so instead of the standard two men, it's got three men in it, um, a driver, uh, the commander, of course, and a radio operator. Um, and it's really the radio that makes this vehicle important. Now, it was armed with a single MG34 machine gun and a ball mounting up in the right-hand corner of the hull. Um, although its primary purpose is not to fight, uh, it's to be a command vehicle, of course. Um, and, you know, this is an important vehicle because a lot of the early Panzer I tanks if they were equipped with radios, they often only had one that was a receiver only, sort of the F1 or FU2 model radio. Um, the later on, some of the Panzer ones were equipped with uh, a, a radio that was capable of both receiving and transmitting messages. Um, but you know, these were expected to be operated by the driver, who often you know he had his hands full just trying to drive the vehicle. You know, sort of overload to work a radio as well. So it was important to have a vehicle, a command vehicle that had a dedicated radio operator um, to do that um, in order to make the workload work better. Um, now 190 of these command vehicles were built um, and their service life actually extended a little later than the standard Panzer I tank, partly because since it wasn't expected to fight, um, 
it stayed in service a little while, and quite a few of them were converted to other purposes also later in the war. Now the next variant to talk about is the Panzerjager I. Now Panzerjager translates into tank hunter. Um, it refers just to any German uh, anti-tank units during the war, whether they be uh, towed guns or uh, self-propelled. So the Panzerjager I was essentially the first attempt to make a self-propelled anti-tank gun on a tank chassis. Um, particularly as it was recognized the Panzer I had very limited um, anti-tank capabilities. They figured, well, let's, let's try to fix that. So, you know, they sort of take off the turret, uh, open up the top of the hull, uh, mount a Czech 47 millimeter anti-tank gun, which at that time was a pretty potent weapon, uh, better than the standard German anti-tank gun, the 37 millimeter um, at that particular time, um, and then sort of build an armored shield that protects at least the, the, the crew on the front and the side. Um, now, of course, this still is, it only allows a limited traverse of the gun, so it can't uh, rotate the gun 360 degrees like a tank normally can, and nor does it provide all around protection to the crew. So um, artillery fragments coming from um, above or behind are going, the crew's vulnerable to that, um, and they're also vulnerable to the elements. Um, since it is an open top vehicle. Uh, this vehicle was relatively successful. Um, I mean, like I said, that gun was quite potent by the standards, uh, the early war standards. Um, it was not used in the Polish campaign. So this is a vehicle that actually comes into play later in France um, and then in the 1941 and 42 campaigns. Um, so North Africa, the Eastern Front, um, and Battle of France. Uh, of course, by 1942, uh, what was considered a potent gun earlier in the war by 1942 isn't. Uh, so these vehicles are becoming increasingly obsolete by that point. And you know, sort of once we're getting to the later war part of the war where T-34s and M4 Shermans are standard, this vehicle's really, really been, been outclassed. Um, and most of them are, are out of service by that point. Now, next on our list of variants is the Sturmpanzer I, um, sometimes called the Bison. Um, here we have an early example of the German Army giving nicknames to their tanks. Now, you have to be a little careful. Some of these nicknames, um, the provenance of them is, is, is a little questionable. Some actually were used in the war. Sometimes they're the creation of post-war enthusiasts or model companies. Um, as far as I know, though, I think Bison is a legitimate one. Now, this was an attempt uh, to mount a German infantry gun on a Panzer I hull. Now, the German Army was a little unusual in that they issued um, infantry guns as standard infantry weapons. So as whereas most allies, you know, in terms of heavy infantry weapons focused on, you know, mortars, heavy machine guns, uh, the German army also issued cannons and they had a 75 millimeter infantry gun and then this sort of honking big 150 millimeter howitzer um, infantry gun. Most armies would consider such a weapon to be, you know, the purview of the artillery branch. But in the German army, this 150 millimeter howitzer was an infantry weapon, and it was intended to be um, used sort of a, a, at relatively closer ranges, um, you know, the ranges that the infantry fight at. And the idea was, well, let's get one, a self-propelled mount, so we can get it up to the front closer to support the infantry. Uh, now, they did this by taking the entire gun, carriage wheels and everything, and plopping it on top of a Panzer I hull and building this big armored box around the front and sides of it to give the crew sort of some protection. Um, and as you can see, it's a really goofy, top-heavy looking thing, and it's the gun's just way too much for the chassis. Um, they built 38 of these, not particularly successful. Uh, the chassis's overloaded. They had a lot of mechanical breakdowns. Um, Obviously, off-road capability with that much weight on this chassis, I mean, it's already not the best off-road vehicle. It's going to be even worse. Uh, crew protection's pretty minimal. Um, and the other problem is you can't carry any ammunition. Um, so the ammunition has to be hauled by a separate vehicle. Um, so not, it's one of the first attempts at an armored assault gun, but not a particularly successful one. Now, the next two variants we're going to look at are um, sort of weird in that they aren't really Panzer ones at all. They have the Panzer I des designation, but they're totally different vehicles that sort of fit the same sort of d design parameters, but really are separate tanks. Um, but they're built in such small numbers and are relatively unimportant. So I'm going to include them in here because uh, they don't deserve episodes of their own. And, you know, the German army called them Panzer I, so who am I to argue? Um, and there's two of them, the Panzer I Ausfrung C, 
and the Ausführung F. Now, the C was an attempt to build um, a better reconnaissance vehicle. Uh, and it's, it started in 1939, so quite a while after the Panzer one's been introduced. Uh, Krauss Maffei and Daimler Benz um, decide they're going to build a better armed and armored reconnaissance tank. Um, so they decide something that's a totally different hull than a Panzer I. It's got a torsion bar suspension with uh, interleaved road wheels, as you'll see uh, is common on later war German tanks. Um, armor's been increased up to 30 millimeters, so over twice that of the original vehicle. Um, yet it's still a two-man crew. Um, with a one-man turret, with a turret uh, equipped with um, two 7.9 millimeter weapons. Now, unlike the regular Panzer I, which had they were matching machine guns, this one's got a you know just a standard MG34. But then it's also got something called the EW141 armor-piercing 7.92 millimeter auto cannon. Now, this is a pretty weird gun, um, and you're wondering how can a cannon be the same caliber as your standard rifle? Well, it's firing the same round um, that German anti-tank guns at the time used, um, which had a relatively small projectile size for an anti-tank rifle. I mean, it's 7.92 millimeter, but of course, you know, the shell case and the amount of propellant behind it's significantly greater than a standard rifle bullet. Um, so it does have some uh, armor-piercing capability, although not a tremendous amount. Um, and this is an auto cannon in that it's semi-automatic. It, it's, it's not a machine gun. It's, you pull the trigger once, it shoots once. Um, but that's what it was equipped with, sort of an unusual weapon. Um, now about 40 of these were built um, and most saw service with the 63rd Panzer Reserve Corps uh, during the Normandy campaign. So by the time they get in service, like, like 1944 we're talking about, um, so pretty late in the war, and you sort of have to wonder, you know, even an improved Panzer I in 1944 is not a very formidable tank at this point. Um, but as we can see in German tank development, uh, the Germans were really bad at kind of reining in companies and programs. Once they started going, uh, even if they were developing things that were either redundant or already obsolete, um, a lot of times they end up going to production before they were canceled. So you sort of see this uh, sort of a lack of overall discipline on their part to really focus on the designs that matter and to produce those in large numbers. And then finally we have what is in some ways the most ridiculous variant and po possibly one of the worst tank designs the Germans came up with in the war. And that is the Panzer I, the F. Now, for lack of a better description, this was an attempt to build an assault tank or something kind of like the infantry tanks other countries were building um, because they took sort of the general idea of the Panzer I, scaled it up a bit, gave it um, much wider tracks with overlapping road wheels, again, sort of like some of the later German tanks, and 80 millimeters of frontal armor, which is, I mean, that's a lot. That's like a British Matilda II. Um, or even you know about the same as, as the German Panther, although the Panther's much uh, you know slope much more heavily, making it more effective. So this vehicle's got uh, tremendous armor protection on the front. Um, it's got a 150 horsepower engine, which is better than what was originally in the Panzer I, but still not a lot. So it's only got a top speed of 15 miles an hour. Or so, um, and it's still equipped with a two machine gun turret. That's it. Um, now the the initial order of 30 of these was put out in 1940. Now in 1940, the idea is already kind of you got to sort of scratch your head because uh, by that point everybody sort of should know that you need something equipped with a cannon. Um, and production uh, was really quite slow on these, so they don't actually get finished that initial order until late 1942. At which point, you know, I mean the Germans got Tiger tanks at this point. You have to wonder what the heck are they going to do with these things. Um, apparently some of them were used at Kursk, which um, I don't know too much detail about. Um, like I said, they were probably hard to knock out, but you know, what could they really do plopping along at 15 miles an hour with a couple of machine guns? Um, most were used for training and internal security because that's about all they were good for by the time they were introduced. So the Panzer 1F, we sort of have to, um, well, we're going to give that one an F because, uh, you know, what the heck were they doing? putting that in service in 1942. The most important tank formation of the German Army in 1939 was, of course, the Panzer Division. 
Unlike most other armies of the time, which kept their tanks in battalions or brigades um, as independent units assigned um, sort of higher up the chain to either corps or army level, um, all German tanks in 1939 were assigned to tank battalions that were part of either a German Panzer Division um, or specifically in 1939 to a light division. Now the light division was a motorized vehicle that was sort of similar in purpose to sort of motorized uh, cavalry. Um, and uh, those all pretty much got converted to panzer divisions after the Polish campaign. Now, when the Polish campaign started, the German army had seven panzer divisions and four of these light divisions, um, and these units contained almost all the German armored fighting vehicles at that time. And um, Guderian had argued uh, that all German tanks should be in the panzer divisions, that they should not be in independent battalions that were sent out to support the infantry. Um, now we will see that there was sort of, um, later on when we get into the discussion of the Sturmgeschultz, the German army didn't leave their infantry units um, without any armored support at all. So whereas most armies at the time um, had sort of what they called infantry tanks that were, could be assigned to infantry units to support them, um, the Germans preferred to use these turretless Stugs. Um, in, in, in sort of a broad sense, they serve that same purpose of armored fire support to infantry units but they're not tanks technically. All the tanks are going to the panzer divisions, at least in the early part of the war. So what this meant was that while other armies would often end up parceling their tanks out to smaller units to support infantry, German tanks are all part of a completely mechanized uh, uh, force um, that could conduct tactical and operational movements at a much greater pace than their opponents marching on foot. Now you'll often see in descriptions of the Polish campaign and later the French campaign, Sort of the, the real quick version is that the Germans are successful because they have their tanks um, concentrated into these large tank units, whereas uh, their opponents are sort of parceling theirs out in, in penny packets, as they're called at the time. That's sort of a simplistic version. Yes, the Germans did concentrate their armor in panzer divisions, but the key is not that their tanks are just all glommed together into one big unit. It's that they're part of a panzer division, which is a balanced, at least relatively balanced fighting force that uses combined arms. So the Panzer Division has uh, plenty of infantry, it's got artillery and you know, engineering and support units, all the things it needs to do and all of it's motorized. So the entire division, all of its components can move at the speed of the tanks. Um, and that's really the important thing, not just that they're all concentrated. In fact, we'll see when we get to Operation Barbarossa in 1941, um, where the Russians have some of these large scale tank units, but they're literally just tanks. Um, and they basically just get decimated because they don't have, they're not combined arms, balanced formations, they don't have the infantry and artillery support that they require. So that's really the key to the Panzer Division. It is um, a complete whole um, and it is balanced. Um, and one other trend we'll see, even on the Allied side, when they do have armored divisions, they usually tend to have too many tanks. Um, and not enough infantry and other supporting arms. And we'll see throughout the war that everybody kind of ends up adjusting their divisional structures um, to actually fewer tanks and more infantry um, within that mix. Of course, as the war goes on, we'll also see the German um, panzer divisions generally end up having fewer and fewer tanks in them, although that has more to do with uh, the deficiencies in German industry. It's, it's not part of an intentional uh, uh, practice on their part, it's just they don't have enough tanks, but that's sort of a different issue. Um, so that kind of explains to a certain extent why the Panzer I, as unimpressive as it is on paper, ends up being part of such a successful campaign because it's part of a team. It's, it's not getting the job done just by virtue of being this awesome machine. It's just part of a larger team that's getting the job done because it's better trained, better organized, and better um, equipped overall. All right, so now we're at the end of the video. This is where we do our sort of evaluation and to a certain extent pass judgment on the vehicle in question. Um, and so this, of course, we're looking at the Panzer I. You know, it's interesting, last week we looked at the Polish TK series of tankettes. Um, and you know, compared to the Panzer I, these vehicles are not all that different. Um, they're both really, you know, on the losing end when it comes to firepower. Uh, mobility and armor, so not impressive, and yet uh, one I would say is a success and one wasn't. Uh, as we said last episode, the TK series really didn't really achieve much.
um, in service, whereas the Panzer I ended up being um, the backbone or part of the backbone of the German Panzer forces at the time when they were at their most successful. Um, so, you know, the German uh, armies achieving their greatest victories with, you know, a tank that's equipped with a couple machine guns, it's kind of crazy. Um, but yet, it sort of highlights um, one of the uh, things Guderian used to say, which is, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, that, you know, one of the most important weapons on a tank is its engine. You know, just by fact of having something that was mobile, that could move and fight, um, regardless of its fighting characteristics, um, this is what the Panzer divisions needed at the time. The other important thing to point out about the Panzer I is that this is the vehicle that the German army sort of, you know, cut their teeth on. Uh, it's, while not an impressive vehicle, uh, that's sort of part of the reason it was selected in the early 30s. It was because it was something that the German industry could build and build right away. It's something that was not very difficult to learn and operate compared to later tanks, so it was um, an effective vehicle for an army that had no experience with tanks at that point, or barely any experience, um, in order to train and uh, start learning their craft. So as a learning tool, um, it was very successful, um, and I think that alone would qualify this tank as a successful weapon system. Um, and then the fact that it actually was used relatively successfully in the field, despite the fact that it was never really intended for that role. Um, I mean, if you look at the numbers, it's interesting, in the late 30s, tank production's not a big priority in Germany. They're way behind on Panzer threes and fours. And the plan is that they're not gonna be going into war until 1942, you know, and then Hitler sort of uh, uh, jumps the gun, so to, so to speak, um, and you know that's a whole other argument about whether 1939 was the right time to launch the war or not, outside the scope of this show. But the fact is that they launched the war with a Panzer force that was really only partially equipped with the vehicles they wanted to be equipped with. But you know, to quote uh, former Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, you go to army with the, or you go to war with the army you have, not the one you might uh, want to have. Um, and so that was a situation that the Germans faced, and uh, the Panther, Panzer I, despite all of its shortcomings, um, was a relatively successful weapon systems in that regard, so we will give this one a thumbs up. All right, that wraps up this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, next week, we'll be doing the Polish 7TP tank. Um, for those of you wondering why we didn't do that one this week, I know in the first episode, we kind of contradicted ourselves in the beginning said that the 7TP was coming next, and the, then at the end said the Panzer I, I decided to just go with the Panzer I is episode two. So 7TP next week. Um, and uh, so stay tuned, we hope to see you around. Um, if you liked this, uh, subscribe. Um, uh, if you really, really liked it, you can support us on Patreon. Um, if you were like, eh, it could be a lot better, eh, maybe it could be, well, you know, we're sort of learning and trying this out. Shoot us a comment, tell us what we can do better. Um, just remind, a reminder, this is a one-man show, so um, uh, as, as I learn and get better at this, the episodes will, will improve as well, I hope. So anyway, with that said, um, take care, and we will see you on the next one. Okay, and before we leave, we just wanted to point out some of the books that are available out there on the Panzer One. So these are some of the titles we used for putting this video together. Um, start with sort of uh, the more affordable end of the line. We got the German Light Panzers, 1932 to 1942. This is, of course, from New Vanguard. And this one is written by Brian uh, Perrette. Perrette. Uh, then next on our list is... Panzer I, Beginning of a Dynasty. This is from the AFV collection, and this title is by Lucas Molino Franco. Um, then there's an older one that's still floating around called Panzer I and II by Eric Grove. Um, and then for people that are looking to spend a little bit more uh, but want more detail, uh, certainly the Panzer Track series is great for that. Um, and there's, uh, of course, by Jensen Doyle, two volumes in this set. So the first volume uh, covers the uh, Panzer Kampfwagen I, the Os. A and B, and then the second volume covers the different variants of the vehicle. And uh, finally, the final book in our, our list here is uh, Spielberger, uh, Panzers 1 and 2. This is the English translation of a work that was originally in German, um, and this one will sort of be probably the most uh, comprehensive and expensive of the bunch, although the copies are available. They're not out of this world or anything. So.
those are some of the books that are available out there. If you are interested, we'll provide links to all of these at the Tank and AFE News website, um, and we'll provide a link in the YouTube description, YouTube video description going right uh, to that page.